Hello, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Hey, it's lovely uh, to see so many people join us for this afternoon's conversation, this webinar. Um, just by introduction, I'm John Kelly. Um, got quite a lot of friends in here today. It's lovely to see you all and thank you for your support. And uh, lots of colleagues who I work with, lovely to see you here. And uh, some new names who I, who I don't recognise who have just joined uh, and are, are joining the conversation. You're very welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, just so you know, um, the whole event is being recorded and we'll, we'll be sharing it later on, uh, on on all the usual channels. Um, the event is being BSL interpreted by uh, Shula and Becky. Um, and also um, we have live captions uh, being done by Kadja. Thank you so much. Uh, you can access the captions down at the bottom of your screen by clicking on the closed captions thing uh, button there. And uh, the captions should be appearing and working now. They're working lovely on my screen. Um, if there's any problems, please click on the Q&A um, and you can message any of us and we will try our best to resolve any issue or problem that you might be having. Um, we will do, our, it's a live event, so we will do our best to audio describe things as we go along. I'm a white male. I'm wearing a black shirt with a little red bit down the middle. Rock and roll. Um, I've got my fireplace going. It's not a real fire. It's on my television. And like every good webinar, I've got a disco glitter ball rolling in the background. Um, I've also got my microphone. And I'm kind of in my living room with a big on-air sign just to the left-hand side of me. So that's it. And I've got my little Kelly Curl kiss... Um, me Kelly Curl right down my forehead as usual um, handed down from generation to generation of the Kelly family so um, as I said we'll do our best obviously we'll make mistakes as the event goes on it's live and we're in zoom land so um, we'll just try our best bear with us um, we're gonna it's lovely to see you all saying hello in the comments um, which is great um, just so that it doesn't interrupt with people's screen readers, we're going to use the chat function at specific moments. Obviously, if that's an accessible way of you saying something, feel free to do it. But if we can limit the chat to the times when we ask you to use it, that would be really, really helpful. It just improves access on Zoom. Um, yeah, there's not too much going on. Um, and also you can put things in the Q&A. And that won't interfere with screen re readers. Claire's got her hand up. So, um, Claire. Hi, John. A couple of people can just see the BSL signer and not you in the Q&A. Three people. That's a bit controversial, isn't it? They're not missing much. Um, how about now? I can I can see me and the okay a couple of people a couple of people can see both now great yeah we've tried our best to control the zoom view um so um Claire will be spotlighting the various guests that come in and out as we go along um uh, but hopefully the BSL interpreter will always be on your screen. Um, and as I say, uh, I will try and audio describe as we go along as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to uh, move on just a little bit. And uh, the next slide, I've moved over to the side of the screen. And um, in the panel next to me, I've just laid out what we hope to get through in the next sort of hour or so so obviously we are here in setting the scene which is just getting everyone comfy and used to this crazy world that we now know as zoom land um 
And then we're going to go down the studio and have a little chat with John Merriman all about the work we did uh, with John down at Crown Lane Studios and talk about access uh, at the studio. Um, then um, we were fortunate that we were able to provide an opportunity for an artist to shadow the experience. And Patrick made a lovely film um, all about his experience of shadowing us making the album. Um, so we'll show that and then, um, we'll have a little micro break and that will be a chance for you to have a little bit of space off the screen and just to get in your questions to the panel and also to share your chat. That will be a chance to put your comments and your thoughts into the chat thing. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion. Um, and we'll try and answer as many of your questions. If we don't answer all your questions today, we will follow it up. We'll keep the conversation going after the event. And then I'll try and wrap up and make sense of it all if I can, which will probably be quite impossible, but we'll give it a go. So that's the kind of outline, and I hope it's something uh, you, you signed up to and sounds like you've come to the right webinar. Um, so... Um, Next, what I just like, obviously, I've been blessed. I've done a lot of work with some amazing people. And um, one of my first messages really about accessible, working in accessible ways is to have as much support and expertise around you to, to get it right. So that as an artist, um, we can give 100% to the performance or to the song that we're recording. So I've been blessed to have some brilliant partners. And this next slide are all the partners who've been involved in the project with me. So I'm going to just read them all out so that it's uh, audio described. We've got all the logos of each of the organisations. So Crown Lane Studios, Grey Eye Theatre Company, Sage Gateshead, Attitude is Everything, Drake Music, English Folk Expo, Musicians Union. And this uh, webinar... Um, was part funded by my R&D programme with Unlimited and the accessibility work we did around the recording was funded by the Arts Council of England. So I thought it'd be really nice just for a few moments to um, welcome Harry from Unlimited just to give you a brief overview of kind of Unlimited and um, sort of contextualise the, the R&D work that I've been doing uh, uh, through the Unlimited programme. Harry, over to you. Hello, thank you, John. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Harry Murdoch. I'm programme coordinator at Unlimited. Um, I'm a white man in my late 20s. Um, I've got dark hair. I'm wearing a dark jumper, sort of red in the lower half, but you can't really see that. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm in the shape office, so there's a sort of blank concrete wall behind me. Um, Unlimited is a commissioning programme for disabled artists um, and in partnership with Sage Gateshead, who John just mentioned, we gave John a grant for the research and development phase of this project. Um, and today is sort of the culmination of that. Uh, so really happy to be here and, um, and seeing um, all of that sort of documented and the progress that's been made so far. Thanks. Thank you, Harry. And I would sort of signpost you to Unlimited's um, website. They've got some great resources. Later on, we're going to be talking about things like Access Riders, and they've got some some good uh, information on their website, as have all the other partners. But you know, Unlimited has got some some good resources there. So I would, you know, signpost you to that. You'll get an email at the end of the event with all the sort of key links um, and. Um, I'll, I'll put a partners thing um, up on the um, on the video once it's it's gone up. So they'll all be there. So don't worry about finding them now. We'll help you with all that information. So thanks, Harry. And uh, we, we, we might see you later if anyone's got any questions about Unlimited. Um, so without further ado, I think we're on schedule. I think we've covered all the bases. I hope you're sitting back and feeling comfortable. Um, yeah, just enjoy the next sort of 45 minutes. Um, feel free to join the conversation. 
ask as many questions uh, as you like. And obviously, I've learned so much on the way. I'm no way am I the expert in this. I'm still kind of learning. And I know that's a cliche, but trust me, back here in my house, I'm still learning, believe me. So um, I thought it was about time we went down the studio recording in an accessible way. Um, now, um, I actually, as a disabled artist, have been a live performer. Um, I haven't done a lot of recording um, and I realised it was a real gap in um, being recognised or acknowledged as a, a professional musician. Yeah. So I've come late to the game um, and I was really fortunate that um, I had a local studio that was accessible. I've done a lot of home recording and one of the questions I put up um, during the lead up to this was, you know, has home recording, you know, changed the game as it were? And, you know, most of the comments that were put up was, yes, it has. It really has met, meant more access and we've been able to do things at home. But I kind of knew as an artist that I could only take it so far. I didn't have the expertise in sound engineering and all that sort of stuff. So I needed to, like I said right at the beginning, build that team. So I was fortunate enough to find Crown Lane Studios just down the road. And I'd like to welcome John Merriman um, into the Zoom. Hi, John. Let's uh, hey, good to see you, John. Great, great to have you. John has decided to go with the scarf look, which is great. We like that, John. Thank um, you. Yeah, so, no, I was, I was very proud of this. Um, my boys pulled it for me. So, yeah, I'm a, for those of you that, that require it, I'm a, I'm a white male and I'm early 40s, but apparently on the phone, I, I sound like I'm a lot more, a lot wiser and a lot older than that. So, um, but yeah, I am on, only in my early 40s and I'm, I'm sat here in the studio in Morden, Crown Lane Studio, so surrounded by um, gear and piano in the background and a mixing desk and yeah, all the chaos as it was left as I just finished recording a session this morning. Great. And, and John, we had, you know, we, we had an amazing time there and, um, you know, a lot of this is about the process and we spent a lot of time planning and, and the process. And I, and I just wonder if I could just start by asking you about kind of what you've done at Crown Lane in terms of accessibility um, and, and sort of the, you know, just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, if you could paint a picture about what Crown Lane is like for people and, and what you've done around access at the studio. Absolutely. So I'm very fortunate that Crown Lane Studio, um, which is my business I've been running for 20 years, the studio itself is based in a very flat, very accessible town, Morden, which is on the underground network on a step-free station at the terminus of a bus route, well, six bus routes. So in terms of my starting point, I was very, very fortunate that the studio I was building was in a place that was already relatively accessible to get to as a foundation. So everything we were doing was starting from a, a, a very good foundation. And I know John and I have talked about this on a number of occasions that accessibility for a studio in particular um, isn't just about what happens on the inside, it's how you get here. So for us, things like building relationships with accessible cab drivers, wheelchair cab drivers has been also part of the journey so that for people coming here, they know that all of that is taken care of as well. So I think that's for me, the making sure your foundations are right. And that's what a lot of it was already done for us in, in where we were located. Great. And, and then when you get into it, you know, I mean, we had quite a lot of conversations about kind of that that was so important, that kind of, it's not, you know, a lot of um, the importance of access is, 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 is around the, the context and uh, thinking through each of the steps and, and breaking it down. And I, I found as, uh, you know, going in and spending time acclimatizing myself and getting to know the space and then I could sort of slowly work out for me physical access was quite important so where I put the Kelly caster and where I put the keyboards and how I could access it myself so that uh, my performance would then be um, I was comfy with it 
Um, tell us a little bit about the layout of the studio and, and maybe some of the features that you've you've put in there in terms of accessibility, John. Yeah, certainly. So the studio is basically a very, very long, thinnish building where the corridor winds its way from the beginning, from the road, through a coffee shop, through a narrow opening with a ramped entrance to all the studio rooms. So first of all is a room that we kept on a much higher level, which is a live room, which means that the window is also lower and it's just just behind me. We, um, so if you're if you're performing in that room, you are actually on a higher level. So if you're in a wheelchair, for example, your eye line is the same as everybody else, um, and you don't feel like you're sort of what's often been described as like in a playpen through through the other side of the studio where our original live room was, where where it's a much smaller window. And, and you can feel a barrier, which is not just a barrier to performance, it's to the whole creative process and being able to pick up little nuances in people's performances in particular. All of that has been knocked down by having this enormous window and a much higher room. So that's the first room you come to. Then you come down the corridor and there's a um, the room that I'm actually in, which is the live room, which we've moved pretty much everything out of. So there is only a space that you can use in, in whatever way you want so we made we changed what neutral was at the studio so that neutral ended up being a space that had a lot more room to maneuver and and get rounds as well and also there, there aren't obstacles to trip over all the way around the corridors as well so um that's the first room second room and then continuing down the corridor we've got another live room no steps anywhere through to uh, another live room at the end. Again, no steps, all the way out to an accessible ramp where the deliveries come in, where we have all the stock for the shop comes in and where anybody who wants to come in a vehicle or coming on a bike can, can come in through that way. So that's kind of the physical setting of the studio. The, the changes we've made are, um, are very subtle and ongoing. And I would say some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. Um, one that's coming up, one, one big one, was that I was very keen for us to have a hoist in our accessible toilet. And um, for many of you, I was looking at the comments just before this started, I, I haven't been able to dive back on, but I saw many uh, independent artists and many independent artists will need to, at some point, come to a studio but it isn't possible for a studio to get a grant to get a hoist fitted. So what we have done is um, a fundraising campaign to raise awareness as well. And we are well on the way. Um, well, we're, we're over halfway. Um, and I know John's been monitoring it with me. Um, but uh, I've set the deadline of Easter. We will have a hoist fitted by Easter, whatever. And um, that's one of the sort of bigger step changes. Um, the smaller ones are signage. Um, we changed all our signage to three times that of the requirement. And uh, also, I, I hate things that look naff. I'm a bit of a design. I think things that are designed well are important as well, especially in a creative environment. So all our signs are designed by um, a top designer. So they all look great as well as well as being dementia friendly. So all our signage right through from inside the toilet, which reminds you where you were going when you come back out, all the way through to every single room of this very long corridor, all make sure that it's very straightforward for, for anybody who's coming in here. There's lots of other smaller things. I'm more than happy to go into, can I tell you one of the smaller ones? <laughs> okay. One, one that, is that all right, John? Yeah, go, carry on, sorry. Is, uh, is I, I think it's asking the question of, is there a barrier I could remove to make it easier for you at the studio? And in asking that question, I think all of our changes have come from the, the, the most recent one that, that John said was, um, did you know what high proportion of accessible toilets have a pedal bin? <laughs> and uh, it was only in thinking through what that means were we then able to get a motion sensor bin 
for our accessible toilet. So that was one of the smaller changes that we've made more recently. It was, a, it was kind of a bit of an ongoing joke between me and a couple of artists who tour, and we always go in and go, don't they realise you can't use the pedal? It's like, you know, why did you put in that pedal bin? In the, so it was, a bit of a, it was a bit of a joke. And, and when, when I went in the studio, we suddenly realised that there was this automated bin. It was just like they're really taking on the... They're really taking on the, the smaller details now, which was just amazing. John, I think what you said there, there are two things that I'd kind of like highlight. One is that um, the, the musicians that I engaged in, in the band for recording, you know, we were all diverse and, and, and had different access requirements. And, and we were able to kind of that, that kind of nuance about our performances, you know, being able to use the space flexibly, have spaces where... Um, there was the space to set up the equipment. Um, also, that kind of visual thing. We had, um, you know, um, artists with uh, who were who identified as neurodivergent, um, artists who had hearing impairment, and people with physical impairment. So the the environments kind of the you know it, it met a, a, a range of uh, kind of the nuances when we were playing, which I think was really really important. And I think the other bit that, that, that you said that's really, really important it was that flexibility that because the social model of disability would sort of suggest that, um, you know, it access is about the environment and we've lost John for a minute, but hopefully he'll come back in. But, you know, the, the environment is what creates the barriers. And sometimes we just need to think about that and, and address that um, in terms of preparation and planning. And and I think one of the biggest access things that 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 was really really important was that space to prepare and plan things so that we could have a quiet space, that we could have a space where I could fling all the gear and spread it out or, or whatever was needed and and uh, do that. I just um, wonder, John, from your experience, um, if there was um, any sort of top tips for anybody that's listening who has a studio because obviously none of us get it all right you know it's it's impossible to get things because I think access is a moving feast what's accessible for me isn't accessible for someone else it, you know it's it's nuanced and it's different for each person I just wonder if there's like um you know what what would be your golden nugget to people who are thinking about access in their own studios I think um, I've, I've, I've tried to make sure, well, my thing would be not to just keep moving with what the current trend is. So um, thinking, oh gosh, we've suddenly got to do this or we've suddenly got to do this. Actually thinking what is right for my context and my clients and looking and starting from that point of view, thinking actually for the clients that we've got and the clients that we're really keen can access, what are the small changes that we could make to mean that will happen? And much of that actually comes from conversation. And I think time spent in, in the pub, for example, with John, or just in conversations in the studio, suddenly problems that seemed perhaps big to John initially were ones that were very easy to, to come to a conclusion on how we could fix them um, just through conversation. And through through those conversations, I've I've sort of summarized it and I, I put it together on my website now into, into categories like a bit like an access rider. And it, it explains everything we've done under each area. So at crowningstudio.co.uk forward slash access, we and I can put the I can put the link in the um, chat um, later on. Um, but under there, under each area, under vision, under hearing, under neurodiversity, I've, I've listed all the, well, some of the changes. I've done seven for each of the changes that we've made. And I, th I think one of the big things, for example, because I'm determined to be a commercial venture to ensure that this works as a business, it, it works for, as a business. Um, I don't get grants, I don't get support for any of the changes that I make. So I have to make sure there's a, a good business case for it as well. So one of the changes um, that I think is crucial that a lot of people don't look at, and I think it comes to back to what John was saying about having time 
to prepare and making sure he knew the the environment and how it could work for him is looking at pricing and um if we just price to be the cheapest or the, the most efficient or um price per per day or per hour actually um creating art with people with a whole range of different needs um actually chronological time doesn't necessarily work as the best measure of how a project could work and get the best results so looking more at what could this project cost that is within the the budget that we've got and then taking the pressure off thinking how many days could this take because actually for some artists a shorter day starting much later is far more helpful than uh well this is how we do it in our studio we we start at nine and we always finish at midnight because we find that a long day everyone just loves it because that's what the that's what the who used to do or whatever um we've actually found that the shorter days you, you often get as much done and done well um and it it can suit people far better to work around their time frames um so i think that's a big thing uh, making sure that it's commercially viable for me as it's my business um so it's made me rethink things right down to, to costing a project. Great. And John, I've got a little um, video of when we were recording. Should we roll it and just do a bit of a, an all, when um, I put this up online later, there'll be a lot better audio description. I'm going to try and do it the best I can live now uh, for people just to give you a kind of idea. Um, but But come back to the YouTube channel later on with the uh, proper audio described version of it. Um, and I'll make sure I get all the detail, including the squeamish photos of me looking terrible on a beer mat. So um, I'm going to roll the film, John, and um, you, you can sort of uh, help me along, really. Um, but we, we spent probably with a band between August and that's the drum and the door as you enter the studio. And that is the glorious Morden at the end of the uh, Northern Line. Or is it the beginning of the Northern Line, as you say, John? Yeah. <laughs> uh, here I am in Studio 3. And as you can see, I'm in direct line with the panel. So I can see the ProLogic screens from Studio 3. And there's me and John working there. And uh, he's keeping me in time. <laughs> <laughs> so that I uh, knew where I was coming in. Um, yeah, it's great, John. Yeah, it's not bad. It's all phone footage. And here's oh, Dave. And you, see, you can see the same space being used in a different way. And this is all Studio 3 with the raised floor. And and that was great for a, a tabla player as well, wasn't it, John? The, cause, uh, yeah, I work with a lot of Bangladeshi musicians who absolutely love the room because for once they're, they're not hidden away. They can, they can be part of the, the process. Yeah. And then we've got pictures of uh, Joe playing the cello and Oliver playing the, the uh, harmonica and the gang singing oh, hey, oh, on the vocal. And here's Ted writing his resignation letter. Say, I don't want anything to do with it anymore. Uh, Paula on the drums and Nixon in uh, in the control room. No, that's in room three. Now we're in the big studio. This is studio two, a bigger space um, with Helen playing the whistle. Um, and there's Patrick on the controls, um, just being shadowed by John. This is my favourite studio two, which is slightly bigger and we use that to rehearse in. Um, and there's Ginge playing the brawn and Siobhan on the fiddle. Um, we had lots of instruments on my album, um, and that was a challenge. But I think what you were saying about the, the feel and the look of the studio and it looking good, you know, as an artist, I, I want my album to be the best it can be. Um, and we worked hard on the sound of the Kelly Caster and all the instruments. And I think that's why I went in the studio was I couldn't do that at home. So the home recording and the studio kind of, um, yeah, it, they work well in tandem. Um, and we've been able to do a lot of work from home together, haven't we, John? But um, this is the terrible bit with my beer mat of my face. Thanks to Claire and Anders for the advice on that one. And here's my disgust at it. 
And this is Metronome Cafe where you can have a drink and it's all accessible there. So there's a little bit of footage of us in the studio and John going, thank God we're getting them out now. <laughs> We've done it. So, um, John, thank you for joining us. We're going to see you a little bit later in the panel. Um, and, and you can you can give us your closing thoughts. Mrs. Doyle says it's three o'clock. My cow has moved to say it's three o'clock, which means it's time to show Patrick's film. Thanks, John. Um, next, I'm going to uh, just share you another short film. Um, this one um, has got subtitles uh, and stuff. Uh, it has a drone in it. So when you when it starts, it's uh, Patrick is a brilliant, brilliant musician. Check him out, Patrick Samuels, um, Asperger's artist. And this is his experience of working um, and shadowing us in the studio. Hi, my name is Patrick Samuel. I'm always looking for new ways to challenge myself, learn new skills, and help others along the way. Last year, I had the wonderful opportunity to get involved in an exciting new project with musician John Kelly through Drake Music, a UK music charity that helps disabled musicians. I found out that John was offering a chance to help in the recording studio and pick up some new skills along the way. The sessions would be held at Crown Lane Studio in South London and overseen by John Merriman. It would be the first time I'd be in a recording studio with other professionals. So far, all the work I'd done on my own releases had been in my own makeshift studio at home. For an artistic person like me, working with John Kelly and John Merriman gave me an opportunity to improve my communication skills with things such as listening to instructions following them and staying on task. Being in the studio, I felt I was in good hands. Instructions were clear and I felt at ease when I'd forget things and need to ask questions again. I got to see how microphones were set up for recording instruments and vocals. I saw which way the mic should be facing and how to route all the cables so that accident-prone individuals like myself don't trip over and send things crashing down. The most fun I had during the experience was being at the mixing desk, where I got to see how John Merriman color codes his tracks in Pro Tools so he can easily keep an overview of them. This is one of the things I have taken on with my own home recordings. The hands-on experience gave me a lot of confidence and helped keep me focused instead of being anxious. I like when I have a single set task to focus on. Kelly and Merriman were great at giving me that. One of the things I tend to lose sight of when recording on my own is keeping things in the green so that my levels aren't peaking or spiking. But I'm more mindful of this now as well. Another fun aspect of the experience was operating what I call the talk box. It helped me practice some listening skills. I had to listen to the conversations between the musicians in the recording booth and the people in the mixing studio, and to flick the switches back and forth so that they could hear each other when giving and listening to feedback. I'm glad I was able to be part of this process with John Kelly, and I hope I helped with getting things to run smoothly. I'm very grateful that adjustments were made so that I could work without being too anxious. And I certainly hope to be back at Crown Lane Studio at some point to do some of my own recordings. Thank you to everyone for having me and for giving me the opportunity to help, learn, and to experience something I've always wanted. Great. And I'd like to really thank Patrick for making that that film it was uh, it was brilliant and i think one of the the really valuable things about being able to provide like a shadowing kind of opportunity was that it was kind of mutual learning i learned cuz patrick's got a lot of experience um of using stuff like logic and 
uh, Pro Tools, sorry, uh, and uh, has produced a lot of really good music, and I haven't. So the the shadowing experience was was a mutual learning thing. I learned as much from Patrick, um, and it was really good having Patrick around because he made us just think about things in different ways and work in different ways. Um, and actually, I, I kind of sensed it. It brought like a a kind of a, a calmness to the process. So uh, John would explain um, what we were going to do. And, and Patrick, as you could see, was hands on. He, he, he did it a lot of the time. Um, and by through Patrick's learning, we were all learning, if that makes sense. And so that for me was invaluable. Um, and I really appreciate Patrick's feedback and you know we had lots of conversations about how things felt um, and that was really really invaluable to me as an artist thinking about how I approach my own music so I hope that's been useful right we're halfway through the webinar just over um, I'd like to offer you all now just a little screen break um, I'm going to turn the camera off um, and this is a chance for you to Chuck in your ideas in the comments and in the chat. Say what you're thinking. Share your experiences. And also, if you've got any questions for the channel, uh, for the for the panel um, after the break, we're going to be talking about things like access riders and um, accessibility in the music industry and and how things are changing by involving more disabled people in the industry. So, you know, we're going to open up the discussion. If you've got a question for the panel, now's your chance to start putting it into the to the Q&A and putting your chat in um, the chat. And we'll be back in. I'm going to give it like three minutes. So have a little screen break and we'll come back and we'll be with the panel. I hope you've enjoyed the first half. Let's have a screen break. Oi, oi. Just waiting for the. Who's joining me? Is it Shula or yeah? Hi Shula. Um, welcome back everybody. Um, questions are coming in, which is great, um, and we'll we'll pick them up. I should have said actually that you can also um, when we get to the panelist bit, you can raise your hand and we can turn your microphone on, um, and we can even elevate you to panelist if you want to be seen but you don't have to do that obviously um just if you want to you can raise your hand and we can hear you um ask a question verbally if that's more accessible for you so there's multiple ways you can ask questions um i saw a question about do i work with electron other electronic artists um and um just so you get a, a bit of a a sense of that on my YouTube channel I've got a playlist of all the artists I work with so for example Joanne Cox who you saw playing the dragon cello um, she does some amazing um, uh, electric tech stuff with the cello and pedals and also accessible music technology with lights triggering um, with the sounds which is amazing um, Oliver, who played harmonica, again, used a lot of music technology. So a number of the artists also use music technology. Um, and there were a lot of wires lying on the floor of Crown Lane Studios. The Kelly caster, obviously, is a, a bespoke instrument and, again, um, has a, a, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, electronic accessible music technology, is what I'm trying to say. So thank you for that question. We'll try and pick up the others as we go on. So I'm going to um, start to invite the panel uh, to join in now. Um, and um, I've had, I'm a member of the Musicians' Union and I've had um, a lot of support from the Musicians' Union. Um, I work with Musicians' Union around the social model and also their disabled um, membership rate. Um, I would like to welcome Rosie onto the panel. Rose, I keep calling it Ro Rosie because I've got two really close friends who I know as Rosie and it's really hard to break the habit. Sorry, Rose. 
Rose, would you like to or you describe yourself and just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the role of the, the MU in, in, in the conversations we're having? Um, ah, can you hear me now? Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I, yeah, I'm Rose. I am a mixed race uh, Asian white uh, woman. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I have long hair and big eyebrows and glasses. Um, and I'm the Education and Equalities Officer at the MU, uh, which is the only trade union for musicians in the UK. Uh, we represent about 32,000 members now. Um, and we support musicians um, in their work and lobby the government on their behalf. Um, and our work is led by the members. Um, so as you, as you said, John, we've, we've recently introduced a disabled musicians concession rate. Um, and we also developed an access rider template with the IVAS Academy as a result of working with our members too, which we're really pleased about. Great, thank you, Rose. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Rich Lenart uh, now onto the panel. Rich, um, welcome to you. Uh, Rich is from Attitude is Everything. So again, Rich is going to do a bit of audio description and just tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what Attitude is Everything is up to all things access riders and changing the music industry. Hey, John, um, really good to be here. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Rich. Um, I'm white male with uh, very blonde hair. Um, I'm wearing a brown jumper and I'm in my um, office here in South London. I unfortunately do not have a disco ball or a digital fire. I am short of digital kindling at the moment, so I'll have to hope I find some of that soon. Um, so yes, I work for um, Attitudes Everything. I'm an artist development manager. Um, we are a um, music uh, charity um, with over 20 years experience working with the music and live events industries. Um, what we do really, I try to describe it for everyone watching um, and listening in a nutshell is um, connect deaf and disabled people um, with those industries, the music industry and the live music industry um, to improve access together. So um, we seek to remove barriers for um, deaf and disabled um, artists, musicians, um, professionals and volunteers. And a lot of the, um, a lot of what we do is underpinned by research which we carry out um, to learn about um, the experiences of those people who are either seeking to perform in the music industry or record music or work as our, uh, managers or our, um, agents or to volunteer at festivals um, for example and my work focuses on the role of uh, of artists within the music industry and therefore we are engaged uh, a lot with the conversation around um, access riders um, and it was really really fascinating to listen to um, John Merriman talk about his work at Crown Lane Studios it's just fantastic to see in a, a really brilliant blueprint for how we'd love to see things done across the country. And I, I, I'd just sort of say as, as another partner in the project um, Rich, you've also provided kind of ongoing support to me, sort of, you know, like one to one sessions where we've had conversations about what's going on and some of the dilemmas that, that, that we face. And that that's, uh, you know, part that's been really valuable for me as an artist, just to know that I could call on you and have a, a conversation or, or, you know, just to touch base, really, and know you know, I learned a lot about the different schemes of attitude is everything and the work you're doing with venues so that when I, as an artist, am going into venues, I can be sort of mirroring or, you know, signposting people when they need a bit of support to go to, to attitude is everything uh, when, when they're up for it. So thank you, um, Rich. And I'm going to finally uh, invite John back onto the panel. So there, ladies and gentlemen, is your lovely full panel of, of people. Um, and I'd like to kind of get, we've got some questions in and I'm going to ask Claire to give me a, a bit of a hand. But um, I just wanted to get the ball rolling by asking you 
uh, about your thoughts on obviously access riders are a hot topic and there's a number of comments about wanting to learn more about access riders or or what they are and stuff so it'd be interesting to hear from each of you your experience or your organization's thoughts on kind of access riders um so i'm gonna i'm gonna start with rose on that one so rose you you said you've got a, a sort of template for people do you want to Tell us a little bit more about the Amuse sort of experience of access riders. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so the template's online now, um, and we also uh, really want to hear feedback from members um, using it as well. So I think you think you can tweet us at we are the MU, but also um, emails um, at qualities at the MU .org, um, really helpful. Um, but we're we're also actually working on a campaign. Um, alongside that, because we think it's like a multifaceted approach, it's um, to try and make it an industry standard. Um, so we're working on that this year. We want to make it basically just more standard practice for venues, employers, people that are working with musicians to ask and start a conversation about access requirements, access needs, just to think about it, because the conversation doesn't seem to be happening. Um, and that's kind of how we see the access rider as, as um, I know some people, some musicians have told us they're a bit cautious or a bit wary about, about using one. Um, but um, we, we were trying to make it seem like one part, one way of starting a conversation. And we have had musicians who've had really good experiences um, using it. And also we've heard from venues and other, other people working with musicians who've realized that access doesn't necessarily cost money, doesn't necessarily cost a lot. Um, and it's basically, you know, some a document that puts out in writing expectations or needs for two parties or more working together, makes it to make it a better working environment, a better working relationship. Um, and yeah, we we'd also like all musicians to use them. Because access, you know, they, the needs we think are very different for everyone. Um, we, we think they'd be a really good thing for everyone to use. Uh, and Rich, what's what's your take on um, access riders? Uh, what you know, what what uh, attitude is everything's kind of a message on kind of access riders? Yeah, so we've been involved in conversations with. Um, Rose and John at the Musicians Union um, and been supportive of um, and their work with Access Riders so far. Um, from my perspective, um, I think it's a, a brilliant way of um, boiling down what we're kind of, what we're talking about when we talk about barriers and disability and we use lots of phrases um, that can be quite general but actually when we boil it down to what people need it's a much clearer um, way of understanding if you haven't worked with a disabled artist or musician before of actually um, what the word disabled actually means in that sense is that, that there are these um, needs that, if, um, that are not met then that person will will become disabled by those barriers um, and so I think that it's a very um, a clear way of understanding really um, understanding why that is the case um, a clear demonstration of that so I think they're very important in that sense right. um, we have a network of artists the next stage network and from when I talk to those artists many adopt um, using an access rider in some shape or form and they like to um, send that in different ways or they have a manager or an agent send that on their behalf. Um, but others also prefer not to send a, an access rider at that point and like to deal with it conversationally with a promoter. Um, so there has to be a little bit of kind of flexibility. Um, and I think I really agree with Rose's point that there are other facets and angles to this and something I'll talk about maybe later on in the panel is our work with promoters as well, because we feel that that there is one thing sending an access rider, but on the other side, we want to make sure that promoters feel uh, equipped and ready to um, meet the access needs of artists and musicians when they're, when they're submitted. Uh, and John, from, from your point of view in the studio, what's your experience of kind of 
access riders. There is. There, I wonder if we can get this question sort of answered as well, John. If you can in your in your in your response. Uh, Traherne Culver. Sorry if I've pronounced your name wrong, but Traherne has asked about your experience of working with electronic uh, musicians having any specific access needs. So I wonder if you could weave that into your access rider uh, uh, experience, John. Okay, um, I'll start with the electronic one just to get it done. Yes, I work with um, musicians from, from lots of genres. Um, I would say my main um, area of expertise expertise is working with musicians with an organic sound source of some sort. So um, that they have created a sound on an instrument, be it electronic or, or whatever. And then I will then work with it from that stage. So yes. Um, tenuous link back to um, access riders. Um, I can give a, a very good example of what happens when there isn't an access rider. Um, if I could just share a very quick story of um, a recording session that happened midway through the pandemic and I was working with a um, an A-list actor um, who was at the studio in the next room to here and the producer was up in Manchester on my screen behind me and uh, it was actually for a spoken word project, not a music project. And the actor was very well rehearsed, incredibly well prepared. Um, there no visible disabilities whatsoever. And, uh, but I'd noticed on their screen, they had a green background and they'd got everything font size 30, I think it was. It was absolutely enormous on their iPad. Just before we started, the producer in Manchester said to me, oh, John, um, I've just emailed through a new version of the script. Could you go and print it, please? Um, I knew the needs of my client and the producer didn't know. Um, the long and short of that story is that actor lost the job um, because as much as I was willing to offer, I can extend the recording time, doesn't matter. Um, we can arrange another day and do it. The issue was that without the rider, the, the, there was a huge breakdown in communication, um, which resulted in the whole project being lost um, and a new actor being brought in for day two. Um, so I would say they are 100% necessary in, in the um, world of music recording and the arts. Um, and I think the main thing is with an access rider, it means you can, you can um, move straight onto the actual creative process. So um, for example, um, recording with John's project, I don't remember, but because we were all aware of what people's needs were from the beginning, there were very few times where any of that was the conversation. Most of the time we were talking about music, arrangements, guitars, alternative, let, why don't we try this? There was one point at which we stopped all together and uh, wrote a sort of spontaneously wrote a whole string arrangement to one particular section, which um, as John was singing it, I noticed that he was particularly passionate about this, this one particular line. Um, and I thought the the strings improvising under it, each take wasn't really working. But because I knew from the beginning what people's um, requirements were I knew that the, what they would be able to cope with on the day and what they wouldn't and I knew that the two particular musicians that we had would be able to cope with me suddenly thrusting at them a very scribbled down um, string arrangement for an eight bar section of, of the the piece so with the access rider I knew although that time and John and I have talked about this a lot the access rider wasn't a written down document it was a verbal and a lot of verbal um, conversation leading up to the recording process. Um, but because we'd had those conversations, it meant that the creative process was able to flow so much freer. And I will say now that I think those eight bars are probably some of my favorite on the album um, because of that, because everyone was able to work to the absolute maximum of the, and beyond. I think everyone went over and above on that particular day. I, th I think one of the messages about access riders is it it can be done in different ways, but whatever way works for you, it it can become a really really useful and important tool to bring about change and to bring about kind of those conversations. Um, I I think one of the things I've learned from um, inclusive cultures and working um, 
in in that is is the idea of just not feeling apologetic about asking for your access requirements just being confident to say for me to record the best i can and to perform at my best this is what i kind of need and can we work towards it these are things that are definite i definitely need to be able to go to the loo how are we going to manage it uh, whatever it is whatever your access requirement is it's just that notion about not being unapologetic you know being unapologetic about it because let's face it blue and m ms on your rider is a bit old hat now you know our access riders are really really important to us so just be bold and be brave with saying what are the things you need and not feeling like it's a small thing because actually you know in yourself how important it is and um, Trahan, you got your hand up. I'm going to allow your mic, I think. I hope you want to speak. Um, Trahan, are, are you there? Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can indeed. Oh, wicked. Okay, so got got a few questions for you. I'll keep them brief as I can because I know Brilliant. you want to move swiftly, brother. Um, first off, questions for um, the Attitude is Everything guys and maybe Rose from the music. Actually, no, first of all, question for John. Tell us a bit about the Telecaster. And then my questions from the Musicians Union guys and the Attitude is Everything guys. What's, how, what's the experience? What kind of feedback do you get from promoters regarding access riders? And is this something that has... Um, um infiltrated or been in the electronic music and rave scenes at all have access riders been used there and what's the feedback and things like this great thank you Trey, for the questions let me uh, trade bro everyone else does man yeah great thank you um so uh rich would you like to pick that one up first yeah thanks Trey. uh so um circling back to promoters um i've been i've been really leading a kind of pilot um campaign for the last um year really of independent venue week and um, the, and some of their promoters over the last two months i've been running training sessions with with 20 promoters to get them ready for independent venue week which is happening at the start of february um and there, so there is a there is um a level of engagement within the promoter world of promoters to do around access um access riders are a very welcome document to those promoters um very clearly spell out um what the artist needs um and it it's very much fits in with their other workflows you know like sharing a tech spec or directory requirements or details of um crew and stage plots and stuff like that so an access rider fits in very well for them and 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 i would go with what john john said just to kind of underline that about the artist not being apologetic at that stage it's very much part of the professional workflow of booking a gig liaising about how how it's going to be run um within the electronic and um dance and rave worlds which you talked about and we uh as an organization are starting to become more and more involved with venues and spaces that um work across genres um and i'd say that um there are separate uh, barriers um, to access to performance for DJs, for example, because of the nature of DJ boost and those kind of spaces and, and underground club spaces as well. Um, but there is a lot of engagement with the dance community, um, I think, because in some ways it, it has a lot more communities and sort of subcultures. Um, and we're starting to see people speaking to us from different venues that work just with dance music. Um, well, we, whereas we weren't really for many years ago, we we're predominantly working with live music and uh, guitar music and those those big bigger festivals. Um, yeah, I couldn't speak too clearly on like the very underground and rave scenes because we we just simply aren't connected with those worlds. But we do work a lot with DIY events and DIY event promoters. And one thing I'd always say to them is we have a DIY access guide which is available. Um, on the Attitudes Everything website, which is a fantastic resource for 
anybody running an event that not doesn't necessarily have the funding or backing of like a large large event or a mainstream venue um so for example uh, someone running a, a rave or a kind of electronic event um that was a bit more underground could use that guide and put into practice a lot of the um a lot of the tips that are inside it uh, Rose, is there uh, anything you'd like to add about your kind of experience from the MU in terms of the conversations you've had around access riders? Oh yeah, um, following on from from what Rich was saying, um, we've we've had a couple of festi festivals um, kind of wa warmly welcome access riders, which is great, and um, like like what Rich was saying, um, they've they feel like the document does sit in well already with what they were doing for other staff um, and fits in with other things that they're trying to achieve as well. Um, and it also sits alongside trying to make things more accessible for audiences as well. Um, so that's been great. But um, um, yeah, and the, the other thing is that members who, if they, if they are in a situation where a promoter or a venue is being a bit resistant or they don't know what to do with the access rider or, or how, how to have that conversation, we would strongly encourage ME members to get in touch with us so that we could we could help assist that conversation. Um, because you know sometimes the venue they, they just don't know what to do with it. Um, and yeah, um, hopefully um, the more we know about what's happening, the easier it'll be. And once they understand, hopefully it makes it easier for everyone. Brilliant. Thank you. I, um, in terms of the Kelly caster, uh, that's a bespoke guitar. Um, I've, I've got some new videos coming out. Watch out for them in the next sort of couple of months as we get the date for the album to be released. Um, but there's some videos with the Kelly caster in action at the Manchester Folk Festival with Folk Expo uh, and I'll be putting some some films out but there's already some videos on YouTube about the Kelly Caster how it kind of works and how it's been developed um, and uh, a little shout out that in the future Drake Music are going to have an accessible music collection and we hope to have a, a version of the Kelly Caster there for people to sort of try out um, but there's the, the software side of it as all, which is really interesting and works not just with a guitar, but with all sorts of instruments. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm really conscious of time and we said we'd be an hour. We could probably talk all night. So what I would like to suggest is all the panel go and get your sleeping bags and uh, we have a we have a, a lock in and we uh, keep. No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> um, what Claire has done as 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 grabbed as many of the questions as po possible and the ones we haven't been able to answer today we'll sort of look back at them and and we'll make sure that we we answer them either in a in another youtube video or something like that or we'll 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 email people back if you join the mailing list and uh we'll 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 keep in touch with you and keep the conversations going um Claire, is there just one more question that we could get from the panel? Is there is there anything that is 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 resonating in terms of the questions that are being asked? Claire is in the background, and Claire and Anders are part of the team that have supported me to get today and the whole event and actually the whole album and all the funding and all that kind of stuff together. Because as I said right at the beginning, you need a a team to support you. Claire is in the background. Claire. Um, uh -huh. Hiya. There's quite a lot of really practical questions for John Merriman around offering engineering services, around the creative role in the process with the album, John. Um, uh, there's also a few around access working on a showstring budget. How do you do that? Um, and then I suppose my top one is... Uh, anonymous one it says being an artist is expensive let alone a disabled artist how do you get funding to create a project yeah um i i'll go first with the money side of things because for 30 years of my career i've been doing it on a shoestring and i still do it on a shoestring i do as much as i can um but i realized that actually i'm a professional musician and I need professionals around me to raise the game. You know, I otherwise I never improve my own music. 
So I invested the time into learning about the application process for all the different funders and got help from people to make those funds. Uh, Arts Council and Unlimited um, have lots of advice sessions and help with uh, people and encourage people to make those applications. And trust me, I am not a, a, a person for filling in forms and, and that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, um, it is a big barrier money, but I think um, investing time into your career as a, an artist and looking at all the streams, you know, I'm not I'm not uh, financially viable, um, but lots of arts aren't and needs a lot of support to make it financially viable. I'm not expecting my album to sell millions. You know, I'm expecting I'll be really happy if I can sell 20, 30 copies of a couple of the songs. I'll be really, really happy with that. Um, it's only with the support of organisations like Unlimited and Arts Council that we can raise the game. And then working with organisations like Crown Lane and Attitudes Everything and the MU to kind of understand the challenges and help us to make it work. So I hope that sort of answers that a little bit. I don't know if any of the panel want to say anything on top of what I've just blubbed on about. Yeah, I'll jump in. Oh, sorry. So we'll go Rick, we'll go Rich and then John. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, just on the funding, um, I think you, you made a good point about um, listening to, coming to events like this that are available, um, particularly looking within your peer groups and any kind of connected artists who may have successfully received funding, whether you can arrange to speak to them to have learned about how they went through the processes. It's particularly daunting to start an application process um, not quite understanding what's to be expected and what the benchmark is to successfully receive funding um, so therefore if you can get a sort of context from another artist or musician that's been through that process maybe even if they've just received a bit of feedback that can slightly open up your expectations which um, I think is a big challenge um, but not to write yourself off before applying for any money um, to know that there are people out there who really want to um, represent different um, uh, different people within you know culture and that hopefully funding is a way of um, yeah addressing some of that imbalance and underrepresentation that we we do see on you know unfortunately within like the world of the music industry um, yeah John you're gonna ah. Oh. John was, and then he's disappeared. Let's just see if John is able to come back in. He didn't like that I went first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's live Zooming, everybody. Hey. <laughs> Rose, how about you? Is there any... Uh, so what, what's happening next for the MU in terms of uh, activity and, and, and the kind of conversation we have about access riders and what, 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 what's next for the MU? We're really hoping to get, collect all the feedback from people using it. Um, and as I said, we're, we're working on that campaign this year we're, and we're, we're hoping to get venues, um, promoters, uh, everyone involved at different stages involved in that. Um, Sorry, Rose, there was a question actually about uh, the status of the MU. So we've got people listening from all over the world, actually. Um, and there was a, a, a thing about, oh, is, is the MU a, a, an NGO, a non-governmental organisation? We're, uh, we're a trade union. Um, so if uh, anyone who works as a musician has income coming in as a musician, we uh, campaign and lobby for those working rights, um, so the, the government in the UK. Um, and we also provide support legal advice, representation, assistance, career advice to musicians working predominantly in the UK. You don't have to be from the UK to join, just um, for things like legal things. Um, if you're doing a lot of work or have an aspect of your work in the UK, uh, we'd help you there. Um, the question about a, an accessible studio in Bristol, I do know of one and I will send Caroline the details of it later on. Um, in the follow-up to the event. So that's the question. John, you're back with us. What what were you what were you dying to say? 
what I wanted to add was that um, I think I would want to say that I've needed to have larger ears than I have mouth and be able to listen to to people and especially working with John John's attitude is is one of such grace and has meant that I've been able to learn and go on this journey with him as well um it's certainly not one where I've ever been the expert and um I've I've loved making sure that I know what I'm good at and I know that producing music is right but my priority must remain on removing barriers to make sure other people can produce the music they need to so with, with all of this conversation I just wanted to to thank John for your attitude and, and that, that for a lot of people it's the example that, that people lead like John that will change things and I really appreciate what you've done John to make Crown Lane the accessible place that it is. Okay thank you um, that's really lovely thank you um, I'm very conscious that we need to wrap up because for access needs we're all exhausted I'm fatiguing um, our BSL interpreters have worked uh, and our captioner has been live for the last hour and a half so we do need to wrap things up um, I realized we could have gone on a lot longer and it was a bit risky to go for the hour but I kind of didn't want it to drag on either so it was kind of I you know this was my R&D and I, did, I didn't know when we set this up how how much we would learned and how much we could share and and all that kind of stuff and I guess I underestimated that a little bit but I, I'm really uh, excited by all your comments and your questions and we will follow them up thank you so much so I'd like to just thank um, Rose and Rich and John from the panel and I'd just like to go to the closing scene and then um, say goodbye to you all so thank you to the panel um, and do let them uh, we'll, we'll follow things up so finally ladies and gentlemen oh we're nearly there we're nearly there final reflections so um as you can probably tell, I've learnt an awful lot. And my last screen um, is me at the side again, and I'm going to do some bullet points. And hopefully I'll, I'll do a, a longer video about this, so I, I won't rush it too much. But they reflect some of the key learnings that we've shared in the last hour and 15. And hopefully they reflect the conversations that we've had. First one is about building a team. You know, I can busk on my own and I can play on a street. And, and, and jam and do quite shoestring budget stuff. But as a professional artist, I need people around me and I need to listen to them. So building a team. And I would like to thank Anders and Claire and all my partners for supporting me um, to get this far. But actually, you need, you need uh, people who support you. And I've got many friends here today who share their learning with me and it enriches my life. So thank you to them all. Aim for the best. I am working at the album for it to sound the best it can. Access is part of making my album sound the best it can. So listen to your inner access rider. Your inner access rider is your gut reaction. You know what your needs are and you know that when they're met, you can perform to your best. I learned this with Grey Eye. I really became a professional artist probably about 12, 13 years ago when I started taking that sort of thing seriously. Um, and Grey Eye taught me this kind of thing about literally, um, if you don't have that support, if you put off going to the loo, in my case, um, you don't drink enough fluid. You won't sing properly because you won't be taking on fluids. It's about well-being and looking after yourself. So it was a really, really key thing for me. Listen to your access uh, rider that's inside you, your inner access rider. And then get it on paper and share it. And feel confident to ask for those things. Pace. There's so much I want to say about pace. But actually, we just all need to slow down. Actually, that's the first thing, because pace excludes. Uh, and I hope that the, although we've had a lot in the webinar, I hope we haven't been too fast. Um, and I'm sorry we've gone over a little bit. Um, space, we've talked about the physical space, but the virtual space is just as important. And the emotional space is critical. Um, 
then it's all about being naughty and being bold and doing things differently. And as artists, that, well, that's what we do. We do things differently and be bold and brave with that. And, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll, we'll, we'll learn from it and, and do something else. Um, listen, like John said, I think you can nick that slide for me. Um, listen with your ears and do less talking. And from it, take risks. So I've listened to a lot of the people around me and tried to take it on board. And I have taken some risks. And that's why I'm here today. Blimey. Very scary. Finally, enjoy it. And share it. The world needs to hear your art. Don't put it off. Because I put it off. I, I didn't record for 20, 30 years of my career. I've done a few demos. But, you know, I just kind of stuck with live because it was easy. Um, don't put off those things. Enjoy it and share it with the world. Because the world needs to hear more disabled artists and be more inclusive. And we're the only ones that are going to make that happen. And there are lots of people who want to do it with us. So it's about us working with our lies and, and doing it. It's not, you know, we're not about fitting into the music industry. We're already here and we're part of it and we're shaping it. So ladies and gentlemen, um, Joanne started the conversation off on Twitter, Joe Cox, uh, with one of her tips, disabled people in the planning process, what are yours? Join us on social media, join us in the conversation. We'll follow this event up in whatever way we can afterwards with the resources we've got. Um, thank you all for joining us. I um, hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to end with all my social media links and stuff like that, because that's what Anders likes me to do. And I can say hello to you properly. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thanks to the panel, my partners. Uh, thank you to Becky and to Shula and to Claire and Anders and to you for joining us this afternoon. Take care and we'll see you all again very soon. Take care. Bye bye. Make sure you give us feedback. See you at the next gig. My website, www.johnkellymusician.co.uk Facebook.com, John Kelly Musician Twitter.com, JK underscore Musician Instagram, John Kelly Musician Twitch TV, John Kelly Musician that's it. Bye-bye, everyone. You've all been goat. <laughs>